So yeah, we're, we, uh, I'm just gonna, the last time, I don't know if you guys remember, the last time I spoke a couple weeks ago, we talked about the government on his shoulders. Okay, does anybody remember that? Some of the things we talked about? And the onyx stone and uh, the propitiation, we talked about that, okay, good. Well, we're gonna talk a little more, uh, and I want you guys, if you have your Bible, to open up to um, Leviticus uh, chapter 16. We're gonna do a lot of reading in the scripture tonight. Um, Leviticus, fifth, it's like the third book or the third book of the Bible, yeah, L-E-V-I, Levi, Leviticus, okay, all right, we're going to, and I'll read, it's good. we're going to talk about the Day of Atonement, okay, Leviticus 16, okay, and we're going to bounce around if you guys want to ahead of time find out we're also going to go to Hebrews 9 okay and we're going to go to the Gospel of John uh, probably around 19 and 20 all right <clears throat> so those who, of you who know me know that I interrupt myself or I interrupt you when you're reading so I'll just interrupt myself tonight right Holly yeah Holly's laughing okay okay now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron that's Nadab and Abihu and uh, they had offered strange fire, and they died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place, inside the veil, before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in a cloud above the mercy seat. So don't come into this place only at a certain time. And he said, he said the mercy seat, which is on the ark. Okay, The mercy seat was the lid of the ark. It was solid gold. Okay, solid gold. Had two angels, one on this side and one on that side. Okay. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put the holy, you know, this, you've got to pay attention to this, the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body, and he shall be girded with a linen sash, and with a linen turban he shall be attired, these are the holy garments. Okay. So notice it's linen. The reason it's linen is there's no work in the temple. He, linen's light. It's the same linen that the ephod that David danced in, okay, when he danced before the Lord. No sweat. No work. No human effort. No wool. Okay, nothing to make you like hot. Ah, all right. That other ephod we talked about, that, that garment of the priest we talked about last week with all the jewels on it, remember? They, they took that off. That's what he walked around in, okay? All right, those were the priestly garments he walked around in, Aaron did, okay? But when he was in the Holy of Holies, just the linen, almost like underwear, okay? That's all it was. Therefore, he shall wash his body in water and put them on, and he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats, so two little goats, as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering. That was for him, for himself. And make atonement for himself. It's for his house. So that's the first thing he did. He had to take care of his sin. Okay. You'll hear a lot of times uh, Christians say that um, they, when he went into the Holy of Holies, he had a, a rope around his leg and in case he died and they had to pull him out. And there was like pomegranates and, and bells around the hem of his garment. That's true. There was pomegranates and bells. Not on this garment. Okay. Not on this. Thanks, boy. Not on this garment. And that's that's a fallacy that they they didn't have to do. That. Okay. That, that's a that's a that's a uh, what's it called? A uh, not a wives' tale, a fable. Uh, what do they call those things? It's a myth. We'll just call it a myth. Alright? What's that, hey? Legend? Legend, yeah. It's from the Talmud, uh, the about the Talmud, the Jewish Talmud, which it didn't really happen. <clears throat> so he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. Okay, you're probably wondering what the scapegoat is. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell, and offer it as a sin offering, but to the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be pre presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, and let it go as a scapegoat into the wilderness. Okay, so basically there's two goats. You, you know, he, okay, which goat is going to be which? They, they pull lots. Okay, okay, goat, you're the scapegoat, you stay alive. Okay, 
okay? The other goat dies, and his, his blood's going to be offered. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as the sin offering, which is for himself. Then he shall take the censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, with his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. What do we talk, hear about in the book of Revelation? Uh, before the presence of the Lord, there's going to be golden censers full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Okay? That's where this imagery comes from. Okay? That's why we pray. We're going to fill those bowls up. All right? <clears throat> and he shall put the incense of the fire before the Lord, okay, and the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testament. Remember the mercy seats between the two angels? It's gold. It's sitting on top of the tabernacle. He shall take some of the blood of the bull, sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. Why does that matter? Because the tabernacle faced east. All right? It faced towards... Like if you're in Jerusalem, if you're facing east, it's facing towards the Jordan Valley, it's facing towards Babylon. Jesus, uh, the Mount of Olives is on the east side of the, te of, of the temple. Everything's on the east, okay? So he, said he was standing with his back to the east. And so that's the east side of the tabernacle right there. Okay, you guys get that imagery? Okay. <clears throat> Kill the goat, okay, in verse 15, did I read this already? Then he will shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. Uh, bring its blood inside the veil. Do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So we shall make atonement for the holy place, because the uncleanness of the children of Israel, because of their transgressions, for all their sins, and so shall he do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So there are filthy, sinful people, but they're God's people. And this is the thing they did every year to atone and cover their sins, okay? <clears throat> there shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, for all the assembly of Israel. Isn't that interesting? First you take care of yourself, then your household. Then you do the Lord's work, okay? That's a good principle for all of us, okay? And he shall go out of the altar that is before the Lord, and make atonement for it. He shall make some of the blood of the bull and the, and the goats, and he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it, and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Okay, so what he's doing, the mercy seat, the tabernacle has the bread, that has the Ten Commandments in it, has Aaron's rod, which buds, and by the way, is not, not only did Aaron's rod bud with flowers, but it also had fruit and leaves. So it had leaves, blossoms, Buds and almonds. So how do you figure that out? That's like having an apple tree in there. Okay, we got leaves, we got buds. Okay, that's okay. We got apples, but we have apples and blossoms together. It doesn't usually happen that way, does it? That's a miracle. Okay, that was to say that Aaron is the anointed one for this. Okay, it was Aaron's rod. Uh, that's another story in the Bible. And also, so, and also the manna was in there. So and so there's gold things on top, and God, the whole, the, the the cloud of God comes down, and when Aaron's there and he's dropping that blood there as an atonement, this is a covering, okay? So God, you won't, you won't look at our sins. This is to make up for our sins. And that's the way God wanted it done. But everything there was built according to a pattern that's in heaven, okay? And we're gonna see that in a few minutes. So that it's important that you get how this thing looked. <clears throat> when he made an end of the atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Remember, there's two goats. The live goat is the scapegoat. And you guys know what a scapegoat is, right? Something, somebody we blame things on. Now, hey, who was the scapegoat in the book of Genesis? Who was the first scapegoat? Go on, Corey. You got it. You can get this one. Was it Eve? Eve. <laughs> Eve. You're always telling me. Okay. Always blaming me. Remember the scapegoat, right? Us guys, oh, yeah, well, Eve, you were, she was her. Okay, right? She was a scapegoat. She was blamed. So that's what scapegoat, it's somebody to blame. When you blame somebody, you're making them a scapegoat. You're making excuses, oh, it was this, it was that. We do it all the time. We manipulate gas like that way. Okay. <clears throat> but this was a scapegoat of the Lord, okay? And he shall let Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and send it away to the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities, 
uh, to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. The goat was on the east side of the tabernacle. Okay, the, the, the wilderness was was towards the Jordan River. Israel's going this way. The Mediterranean Sea's behind me. Saudi Arabia is over there. Okay, they're on this mountain range overlooking the Jordan Valley. That's east. Okay, the scapegoat was sent into the wilderness. What was the first thing Jesus did after he was baptized? He went into the wilderness. Jesus became a scapegoat. So on this scapegoat, he lays his hands on and says, um, so, um, Lord, I just lay out all the sins of my people. I don't know what he said, but he said some prayer, and all the sins went on the live goat. Meanwhile, the other goat was dead. Nobody ever heard from that goat. It went to the wilderness and probably died. And it's interesting, a suitable man had to take it out. Then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of meeting, shall take off the linen garments, get this, which he put on when he went into the holy place, he shall leave them there. Okay? And he shall wash his body with water in a holy place, put on his garments, come out, offer his burnt offering, and uh, make atonement for himself and for the people. And he who released the goat as the scapegoat shall wash his clothes, and it goes on. Okay, so you might say, why are you reading all this, George? Because this is a type and a shadow of what Jesus Christ did for us. Okay, so let's turn to um, John. We're going to talk about some of the garments that Jesus had. Okay? John 13. It says, um, verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hand, that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments. Just like Aaron did. And took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet. Remember, Aaron had to get washed, took his garments off, had to get washed, and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. Peter said, oh, I'm not, you know, don't do this. And then um, <clears throat> and Jesus answered and said to him, what, what am I to do with you? You don't understand, but you will know after this. Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Okay, Peter has a way of getting himself in trouble. If I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. Okay, so there was something important happening here. Uh, he was bathed, and he's only to wash his feet and completely clean. And then, um, so when he washed their feet, verse 12, taking his garments... So he basically put his garments back on. And he sat down again and he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? So basically, he just washed their feet like the high priest washed himself. So this was the beginning of the, of the sacrifice of, of the Lamb of God. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go to, so that's one set of garments. Keep in mind, those are the garments he was probably crucified in. Okay. This is John 19. And um, uh, verse 4. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to him, Behold the man. So the Romans had put a purple robe on him, kind of like, like, you're, like you're a king, okay? It wasn't his garments. It was a purple robe, probably over top of his garments. Okay, so the Gentiles did that. We're getting ready for the Gentiles' sin to be laid on him. Now he's crucified. Then the soldiers, in verse 23, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments, and they made four parts, to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. So there's probably four soldiers who did the crucifying of him. Each soldier apart, and also the tunic. So whatever he had on, they divided it into four parts, but also the tunic, which they didn't divide. Hmm. Now, the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. 
they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. So it was probably pretty nice. Okay. Who shall it be? Who did they cast lots for in the book of Leviticus chapter 16? For the goat. Which goat was going to be the scapegoat? I believe this is a symbol of the sins of the Gentiles. Those soldiers were like the scapegoat. The sins were on them. Okay, now, they, they may have, one of them said, surely this is the, the Son of God. Okay. But, so they took these garments, they cast lots where it says in Psalms, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. Now think of all the stuff I just read to you about how the clothing had to be linen, and da 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 da, -da and it was off to the side, and they put it off. Okay. There the soldiers did these things. And they stood by the cross of his Jesus and his mother and all that stuff. Okay, so we, I don't want to read that right now. Now, let's go to the resurrection. <clears throat> Peter therefore went out. And okay, we'll just start from verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 1. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. Actually, I preached on this at my sister's funeral. My sister was a kind of a, uh, an apostate Catholic and kind of didn't want any kind of religious symbolism or anything at her. I don't know what happened to her, but she just <clears throat> didn't want any priests or anything at her, at her funeral. So my brothers and sisters asked me to speak, and I spoke on this because Lauren was a, this is a beautiful uh, artist and gardener. She was a gardener. And, um, and uh, there's so many gardening analogies. But anyway, so... So she ran out. So Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, who was probably John, and said to him, whom Jesus loved, and said to him, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they, put, they both ran together. The other disciple outran Peter, came to the tomb first, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloth lying there. Yet he did not go in. The Simon Pe then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes, the linen clothes, lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. <clears throat> then the other disciple who came first, went in also, when he saw and believed. Yet as they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. And the disciples went away to their own home. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping. And she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. Now, she, none of them knew that Jesus was resurrected at this point. And this is, this is so cool because <clears throat> there was no benefit for them. There was just grief. They weren't like, oh, I can't wait till Jesus comes back so I can get healed. So we can see a miracle. Oh, man, so I can prosper. Right? Western church in America? Okay, so I cast out a demon. They just love Jesus. Their rabbi was dead. They didn't care what the Roman soldiers were there. They didn't care. They went, they did everything against what the Sadducees and the Pharisees said, and they went and put themselves on, especially the women. Especially Mary was a prostitute, an ex-prostitute. Okay? It says something about where's our commitment to the Lord? Is it what we get from him or who he is? Are we seeking his hand or do we seek his face? And I would say it's a sin to seek his hand before his face. And we need to repent of that. Okay? God wants us to do great things, but only under his face, without an ego. Okay? Without expecting anything in return or any extra blessing. Okay? A little hard on that, because it, I see it in the church all the time. I think you guys do too. <clears throat> Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. She wept. She stooped down, looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet. How was the tabernacle set up? Angel, angel. The, t the, the tomb that, where he was laying was the mercy seat. You guys, isn't that awesome? Where was the linen? It was folded up on the side, just like the ironic the ironic priest would do on the side. It is finished. I'm done. My work's done. Atonement has been made for. Paid for. Once and done. Never again. Your sins are paid for. That's the symbolism here. It gives me goosebumps when I think about this. 
Okay? He didn't just throw the garment over there. It's all folded up, nice and neat, in the corner, face cloth was over here. The job was done. He had made atonement. He had done what he came to do. <sighs> Sir, and, and the angels, get the, the angels. So you look at the mercy, you can see that there, there's big wings over top of the mercy. You guys have seen pictures of this, right? Well, that's what it was, one of the head and one of the feet. That's the symbolism of the tabernacle. He's the mercy seat. He's the place for our, uh, the appeasement of God's wrath on us. That's the uh, propitiation we talked about last week, remember? Or the other time. Okay. And the atonement, the covering we talked about. Remember we talked about on Noah's Ark? The first time where atonement is used, that word covering, is on Noah's Ark, where he says, cover it with pitch on the outside and on the inside. Yeah, to keep the water out, you know. It was more to it than that. It was covering. He was, you know, first you've got to cover the inside, Take care of your family. Take care of your heart. Take care of your wife and your husband. Take care of your kids. Humble yourself. Okay? Humble yourself. Then on the outside, the covering of pitch. To keep that storm out. To keep your house protected. To be that, uh, that protection of, of the vessel, of the anointed vessel of your family. And of your, of your heart. Protect it. So that's the anointing. So when you're covered, your sins are covered. You don't have to worry about that storm. There's no judgment against you. It's been towards Jesus already. Isn't that awesome? But don't continue in your sin. Okay, don't continue. If you do, you're trampling underfoot the Son of God. And Steve, this is the question I think you had last week. It was a very good question. Because he died for all the sins of the world. All the sins that will ever be committed. But the only ones that have access are those that have atonement. So propitiation is not atonement. Propitiation is satisfies God's wrath. So that we can now, by grace, come into relationship with him. Okay? So one's the scapegoat. It goes out in the water so all our sins are on him. The other one pays that propitiation. It's the appeasement of God's wrath. That's what that goes. That's what Jesus did. Okay. <clears throat> so. Let me have some more water. Drink some more plastic particles. <laughs> it's funny, though. Or was working the what's that place called? Cafe. The cafe. And I was getting a bottle of water a couple weeks ago. And uh, I gave her a buck and she says, Oh, George, drinking some more plastic particles. I said, Oh, you were listening. I was just telling my aunt that the other day. <laughs> Alright, so now, okay, so we so we see that Jesus now is the high priest. He's a high priest. And you no know, so we're gonna read in, in Hebrews and about what exactly happened because Paul is, uh, is to, well, Paul, the writer of Hebrews is talking to the Hebrew Christians about remember the church, the first, the early church of all Jewish people that had confessed Christ. Okay? So they were Hebrew Christians. It's interesting, it's not a book to the Jews, it's to the Hebrews. Okay? And I heard someone, uh, we always say we have a Judeo Christian ethic. Well, I've heard this guy says, no, we have a Hebrew Christian ethic. What's the difference? Judeo means. That's post-exile, the Babylonian captivity, the Talmud, all that kind of stuff that watered down Judaism. And they came out with all these weird, crazy things and not the law of God. And that's where the Pharisees and Sadducees came from. Okay, uh, That wasn't real Hebrew Christianity. I mean, Hebrew Judaism. Hebrew Judaism was Mosaic. It was the priesthood. It was the Aaronic priesthood. That's the kind of... So, so he's right. And so that's, that was what Jesus was. He's a Hebrew. Okay? A Hebrew. So, um, anyway, probably shouldn't have gotten into that. But. Okay, verse 9, chapter 9 in Hebrews. You guys saying with me? This is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, we're going to talk about the earthly sanctuary, which is what we just did. We just talked about it in, in Leviticus 16. <laughs> then, indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and, earthly, and the earthly sanctuary, where a tabernacle was prepared. The first part, which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle was called the holiest of holies, the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid sides of gold, and you know we read about this, uh, which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod, budded, and the tables of, of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. We just did speak in detail about that. <clears throat> so when these things had been thus prepared, 
the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But the second part, only the high priest went in once a year. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicated this, that the way to the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. So this was just a temporary thing. It was pointing towards Jesus prophetically, okay? That's what he's trying to say. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience. So those things can't do make your conscience perfect. Bulls and lambs and goats, they, can, they don't do anything for your conscience. Okay, it's just a religious act. All right? But Christ, in verse 11, came as a high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands and not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption for the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, through the eternal spirit, offer himself without spot to God? Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Wow. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So those who are called, that's us, you guys. We receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. That, you've got to stand on that. You've received the promise of the eternal inheritance. Troy just talked about everybody's, oh, I've got to do this, i got to do that, i got to be holy, i got to do one more thing, work a little bit hard. You don't have to, okay? Just relax. Okay. Now, I, like with, in our marriage, Corey and I, I mean, I, I do, uh, Corey and I serve each other, we do things, but we don't have to, we get to, it's natural, okay? We just serve each other in our marriage. Corey doesn't have to, uh, but sometimes she does. That's to remind me to do things, okay? But it's, um, yes, honey, okay, I'll get that done. Don't roll your eyes. <laughs> but it's not like works, it's like I'm doing this to get her love, I do it because I love, okay? That's why we serve, okay? All right. <clears throat> For where there is a step, okay, um, uh, verse 19, for when Moses had spoken, every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled with, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with, with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels, and according to the law, most all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. There's no remission without, without the shedding of Jesus' blood. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands. He wasn't in that temple. Remember, he ripped the veil. Remember that? Why did he do that? Because he was the presence of God. And he wanted to show them that's not real. The presence of God isn't there anymore. That veil was like six inches thick. Okay. And all of a sudden, there's the Ark of the Covenant. Whoa, we're not supposed to see that. That was like seeing God's nakedness. No, can't see that. There's nothing there. It was just a piece of jewelry. He was on the cross. Not that he could offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place uh, uh, with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages. So 2,000 years ago, they're saying it was the end of the ages. How much closer are we now? He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and as it appointed for men to die once, after this is judgment. Okay? There's no reincarnation, there's no second chances. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. Wow. Are you eagerly waiting for the Lord to come back? Yes. He will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. <clears throat> so, I guess the reason I'm reading this to you is that, okay, let's just recap. The garments. Were, the Roman soldiers divided them. That's the Gentiles. They, they split up in, into four, four pieces. I believe north, south, east, west. That's the world. Okay. They, they Christ, they took his garments, and that was the propitiation. That was the, that was the, the scapegoat offering. Jesus is... Propitiation offering was on the cross, down in the tombs of the earth, and being raised from the dead. 
And when the job was done, he took those garments, the priestly garments, okay, the, the grave clothes, and wrapped them up and put it down. It's finished. I want to read uh, Hebrews uh, or, or Romans 11. And this is how we... So, the, so that's written to Jewish people. So now, here we are 2,000 years later, and we see what's happening in Israel. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. This is verse 25. That the blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for he needs to. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So that's a prophecy of the coming thing that's going to happen with Israel. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Some people believe that if Israel did not reject the Lord, we wouldn't even be here. So, in other words, if they had received the Messiah and oh, they worshipped him and there was none of this stuff that happened in Christmas, you know, they had received the Messiah. None of us, you know, that's what some people believe. I don't necessarily believe that. Okay. But some, that's how Israel's rejection is the reason we're here. Everybody says, why hasn't the Lord come back? Wow. Well, I've been saved about 50 years, and everybody's talking about the Lord's coming back. <clears throat> well, I've, I've said this in these meetings before. <clears throat> if the Lord came back 100 years ago, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> if he came back 30 years ago, a lot of you guys wouldn't be here, right? So let's look at his delayed return as his patience because he desires none to perish. And he has a calling of everyone. So right now in the world, there are more people that are followers of Jesus Christ than in the history of mankind. Okay? There's like 8 billion people in the world. A large number of them are those who confess Christ. I'm not going to say how many billion or even it's a billion. I don't know. But it's more than there was. Okay, because back then there was only about three million people that lived in the world. Okay, it wasn't a whole lot. If you look at the population trends over history from uh, the time of Christ to now, it goes like this. It's just a flat line. And around 1700, it starts going up. And now it's like this. That's why God's not here yet. Because he wants them. He wants them. Okay, and after that's done, he wants Israel. Okay, so let's watch how we take care of Israel. Okay, so <clears throat> not that I agree with their necessarily their politics or whatever, but God is doing something there. So, concerning the gospel, they're enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. So, because of their fathers, in other words, and because of, because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're beloved, and David, and all the rest of them. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So, if God's called them, he's called them. You can't revoke it. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. So, get that. That's why these people think that, that it wasn't for Israel rejecting God, and we wouldn't even be here. It says, <clears throat> if it wasn't for their disobedience, that, that through the mercy shown you, they may receive mercy, for God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. So he, he, he locked them up, he blinded their eyes, so that we could see. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that's thank you, God. Thank you for Israel, and have mercy on Israel, by the way. All right? Um, and by the, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, and how past, his ways past finding out. So, so I, I don't want to go, go much further, um, but I do want to, uh, I, I want you guys to grasp what happened at the cross. And we sing that song, um, well, we sang the song tonight about the cross. Goodness of God. The goodness of God. And we, uh, but we sing the song, uh, <coughs> How Precious is the Blood. Or, oh, precious is the flow. Uh, it makes me white as snow. I want us to get what happened and what Jesus did and how legally binding it is to those that believe and how it cannot be stolen from you unless you let it. Now, some people will say, we talked about um, this controversy about once saved, always saved. Okay? And I don't believe that for a second. I don't believe once saved, always saved. 
I mean, he says amen to that or not, but I just don't believe it. Because there's so many points in the scripture that says we have to persevere in our faith. Colossians chapter... And this is why we have to be so sober in our walk with God. And, uh, and, and not, um, not be nervous, not be nervous, but be circumspect. So here's what Colossians says. George, I have a question. When you, when you... Let me just read this first. Okay. Scott, hold on. Okay. Colossians. It says, Colossians, that's the one. Hold on, Scott. I'll, I'll get you in a second. <coughs> okay. In the body, <coughs> and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless. You are presented holy and blameless before God, and above reproach in his sight, no blame in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith. If you continue in the faith and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Okay, so. What's the reference? The reference I just read? Uh, Colossians, sorry, 1, um, 22 and 23. Okay, Scott, what's your question now? Okay, you said you don't believe in one saved, always saved. Okay. You said you don't believe in one saved, always saved. Right. So you're saying you can lose your salvation? Do I say who, to who? So you say, you're saying you can lose your salvation? I'm saying either you weren't saved or no, you can be saved, apostate. You, once you're saved, you're saved. Yeah. But you're saying you don't believe I'm that. sorry, so Scott. You're you're, There's too much in the scripture that talks about persevering and continuing in your faith. Okay. So if I marry Corey, mm -hmm. we have a covenant of marriage. What's the matter, honey? Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> you always have to be such a smart aleck. Okay? <laughs> it's a rhetorical example. Okay. So, so, okay, so, okay, when I marry Corey, okay. I mean, I know this. I okay, mean, okay. Some people may not know, but just, just say, so, so. you're saying, oh, I believe that one say, I don't believe that one say, you're saying that. I know that. I know the okay, truth. So, but other people may not know. So, oh, wait a minute. Now you're saying that once you're saved, you're not always saved. Okay. Mm, double standard or okay. something. You're well, going to put different thoughts. When I am married to Corey, okay, let me finish. Okay. Okay. I didn't just walk away from the altar. I would not be married to Corey if I just, you know, we had our celebration, we had our party, had our honeymoon, and just left. It would not be a marriage. There's no relationship, okay? And that's the way it is with our Christian walk. If we continue in sin and we don't pursue the Lord, then there's no relationship. And there, and that's where Christians, many of us get into a spot where um, we presume and we don't walk in holiness. Now, does that mean you have to be perfect and you can't sin? I'm not saying that at all. But when people turn their back on God, Hebrews talks about how can we crucify again the Lord of grace? How can we do that? Okay. Now, there's lots of people in here, myself included, that have done dumb things, oh, had to ask forgiveness, had to repent, hurt people, um, I'll, you know, I can just list the dumb stuff I've done, and it's, oh, God, have mercy on me. <laughs> um, and, but that's the Holy Spirit working that allows me to say that, to be humble myself and ask forgiveness. But when we start to lock ourselves into behaviors and repeated behaviors, and going, uh, you need to get saved because <laughs> you weren't or you aren't, okay? That's, that's what I'm saying, okay? Go ahead. Here, what's, what's your name, sir? I am. I, I, well, I was thinking, you know, about uh, Revelation, when he's talking about the various lampstands and talking about right. sitting them out. Yes. They were, but that didn't, doesn't sound like they were. Oh, the book of Revelation is all about it. Yeah, the seven churches, it's like, whoa. Okay. You're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Okay. Robin. I would think it would go back to then whether you were saved to begin with. So, not necessarily that you lose your salvation, but that whether you were even saved again. Okay, well... Because, like, when Troy asked the question, what does that line mean to you? <coughs> Jesus endlessly pursued us over and over and over again. If we continue to turn our back on him, it's free will. So, if you, were, if you weren't saved to begin with, what you're saying is true. But, you know, it's a heart thing. It's not that you lose your salvation. It's what's in the heart. 
to begin with. Yeah, well, I, I, well, I, I know I that know. I know our, our love can wax cold. Right. Our love can wax cold. And um, I've known some very, very genuine people that love the Lord. Their love has waxed cold, and they'll turn their back on. Paul talks about Demas having loved this present world. Demas was an apostolic partner with Paul in the New Testament. It says Demas, having loved this present world, has turned his back. He loves this present world. Go ahead, Bart. Oh, well, I'm starting. Now, this, I just started up. I thought this was over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think there's another uh, part of it. talks about the vine and the branches. Yes. It says, if anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is yeah. thrown away and withers. Such branches mm -hmm. are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So we have to remain in the Lord. It's a remain. And we could, yes, you, you have to remain in the Lord. Now, but what they're saying, what this one saying always say, they're taking things which are true, and they are scriptural, that, you know, uh, yeah, um, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, there's lots of scriptures like that, but you have to take them in the context of what they're written, and also those that are saying, listen, you have to be persevering in your faith. And you just, you, you, you have to handle this thing like it's, like it's the tabernacle, like it's really holy. It's a holy thing we do. Or I don't think you can, I think if we don't, if we narrow it down to A or B, one saved, always saved, or we, say, or we can lose our salvation so mm -hmm. quickly. I, I, I'm going to say it's C, not the but. I'm going to say that yeah. if we, when we tie our works to our salvation, mm -hmm. that uh, like negates what Jesus has done for us. I think it does, like she would say, it comes down to a heart thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, can, you know, none of us can walk perfectly, okay? And uh, but yet, the the scripture says if you commit the least of these, you can commit them all. So how can that be possible? So I, I think there is a uh, I think it comes down back to the heart thing, okay? But I don't think it's an A or a B. I think it's a C. You know, it's uh, just my thought. And what? Well, so here's the danger. I can be licentious and I can do my thing. Uh, the book of Revelation speaks about, I hate the work of the Nicolaitans. And you, are, you hold to the teaching of Jezebel and Balaam. Well, the work of the Nicolaitans was sloppy agape, easy grace. I can go screw around. I can do this. I can do that. God will forgive me because of his grace. That is an abomination. You know, right? That is an abomination. Um, <laughs> so, so I want you to have the fear of God. We need to have the fear of God. It says in Psalm 34, uh, listen to me, children, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who's the man that loves life, that desires life, loves many days, that he may see good? Let him keep his mouth from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. Let him seek peace and pursue. Let him depart from evil and do good. Okay, so... That's what God wants. So is there mercy and grace to forgive sin? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. But if you go in these things and it becomes a lifestyle and it starts to be, you know, and, and so your connection with God is, is cut off, there's a judgment. And, uh, and I mean, it, it's serious. And so the fear of God needs to be in us. A holy fear not to mess around with stuff. Because we talked about in our New Believers class about the, be the Bema Seat Judgment. And where the wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up and you'll be saved as through fire. Okay. So that's, you know, <laughs> I don't want that. Well, yeah, and, and you know, if, if you have boys, I have boys, and, and uh, I don't think we can force them to love us. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, you know, whenever you get a new heart you know, and, and when you become born again, your desire is different. Like you have a born again spirit, you know. Um, but the, you speak of the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews is uh, very clear. We're no longer under the curse of the law, we're under a new contract, a better contract. 
Then let's live just, that way. Just, just then, 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 then now let's live I'm that not way. Denying anything that okay, you're no, saying. no, no. Let's not just confess it yeah. and say it. Let's do it. Right. Okay. Let's yeah. do it. And if we're not, and not if you're not doing, doing it, no, uh, we can tell a tree by its fruit. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's where I'm coming from. Right. I'm not. I don't want people to be insecure about their salvation at all. We just talked about the covenant <laughs> that what Christ did. Uh, and I don't want people to come under condemnation. But if God's convicting you of sin, just confess it. Amen. Just Amen. repent. Amen. And, just, and just say, God, forgive me. What do I need to do to make this right? Matthew 7, the same thing that um, many will say to practice laws. Yes, practice. Now, we yeah. all stumble in sin, right, right. but let's not practice it. Yeah. And if we're practicing something right now that we shouldn't be, let's repent of it. Now. Okay? Now. Okay. Now. Like yesterday. Repent of it. Because, and so the fear, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, God's laying on my heart the fear of the Lord. And God, what have I done in my 68 years in this life? Okay? The fear of the Lord. What is wood, hay, and stubble? Let me get rid of it now, God. I want to offer you crowns. Now, does that mean I'm saved by works? No. No. I'm saved by grace. But grace teaches me to do the works. Okay. And, and that means to treat people and to keep covenant and to, and to love and to tell the truth. And if I, mess, I hurt somebody, to ask their forgiveness and, and, and not to curse God. And, and, and but so. There's also a prodigal son. So anyway, <laughs> get into that. But anyway, Father God, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for these saints that are so hungry that they'd be here tonight to hear your word. Um, God, we pray that, um, Father, I thank you that we're secure in a relationship with you and that you would instruct us, Father, and we would listen to you of ears to hear and eyes to see, God. We would, we would know and obey you. And, and have a humble heart, not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but have a humble, sober spirit. And just, Father, you, when you use us, Lord, we pray no pride or being puffed up. I just, you, you begin to trust us because there's such humility. <laughs> and we don't steal any glory from you. So, God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus and being our propitiation and being our atonement. We thank you that, that you didn't have to, Father. You didn't have to, but you loved us so much. Even when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So um, we just hang on to that, and we hang on to Jesus. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.